I have to say, that was a fantastic setup uh, for the conversation in the fireside chat for our conversation today, right? It's whether we can have a realistic or do we need to rebalance uh, the global energy uh, transition. I I'd like to start with you, Henrik, uh, to say in 2023, with everything I just said about what's been thrown at us as an energy sector, uh, but also as a global economy, uh, do you still see the energy transition as a threat or an opportunity as a leading wind uh, producer in the world, the one that provides the infrastructure for it all as Vestas? Well, first, first of all, thank you for, for having us here. Uh, also taking a little inspiration of His uh, Royal Highness, uh, the Energy Minister, which I really appreciate. Because if you treat it as what facts is on the table, I think it's an opportunity. But of course, if we move into a world or a reality where we make assumptions or dream about where we are compared to where we should be today, then I think it's becoming dangerous. And what do I mean by that? I think in a world where we often extrapolate and we talk about 2030 and 2040, the energy transition will take a lot longer. So that means we're always trying to anchor a point where we then say that's the say and do gap that is increasing. The say and do gap is increasing, it's not reducing. Um, so I think from, from that, I'm a bit concerned that we have certain countries that are making bold moves and retiring energy sources and not putting something instead. And that causes unrest, that causes unsettlement of those societies we can talk about a few, we can talk about Sweden, we can talk about the UK, we can talk about Germany. And if you're not running forward, you are coming with a deficit in the energy uh, transition. So uh, I think it's an opportunity, I'm positive, but I think we are increasingly running a little bit behind of where we wished we were. Uh, that's uh, an understatement because of the shocks that we've seen, right? Yes. Because we didn't factor in geopolitical risk no. uh, with Russia, Ukraine. I, I think we should, for context, uh, I mean, Nasser, if I can bring you into the conversation here. Uh, three years ago, at the start of the pandemic, we saw prices go negative for the first time ever. Uh, and the effort by Prince Abdulaziz and the rest of the OPEC Plus to come together to stabilize the market. But why do we have the pendulum, societal pendulum overshoots, where we rush to go to solar, wind, uh, we're looking into the hydrogen investments today without keeping the energy system of today to manage the transition. Now we're starting to see U-turns in policy uh, that we've seen in the European Union. How can we have a much more realistic transition that uh, society also buys into as opposed to sitting on the sidelines and actually be very critical of the mismanagement by governments in some parts of the world? You know, we are seeing the shift and uh, Prince Abdulaziz, His Royal Highness, talked about what the kingdom is doing in renewable and hydrogen. 50% of the grid in the utility sector will be in renewable, and we are for green, blue hydrogen, and for e-fuel and carbon capture and storage. However, what reality check is, this is what we are seeing today, the demand growth that we are seeing is significant. We, in the second half of this year, the call on the industry is 103 million barrel. And there is additional, call. this is in the middle of economic headwinds today. And the China didn't pick up fully. The aviation industry is still at 90 to 95% compared to pre-pandemic levels. So there is huge room to growth if you believe that the economy will pick up uh, in a year or two, if you we are confident that China also will pick up going forward. So the demand is strong. Mm. And for that, you need to make sure that you have adequate, reliable, available, affordable sources of energy. So this is where we are investing to bring additional capacity of oil, gas, and at the same time, investing in the new, which is uh, renewable, green and blue hydrogen. But in certain areas, we are also waiting for the demand. Uh, hydrogen is a good example. For example, everybody talks about hydrogen, but you know, it costs much more than 
uh, normal sources of energy, you know, for hydrogen, blue hydrogen is $200 per barrel of oil equivalent, green hydrogen is $400 per, per, per barrel oil equivalent. So when you go to customers today, it will be very difficult for them to sign an offtake for, for you to start a project. Uh, you need an offtake agreement, and you're talking about uh, something 15 years or more so that you can start this project. The demand, uh, the rhetoric is there, but the demand when you ask them to come and sign the offtake is not there. So I think there is significant demand growth. That, that's what we are seeing. That's why we need to solve for the trilemma that His Royal Highness also mentioned, which is energy security, affordability, in order for you to meet your sustainability goal over the long term. Without solving for these two, you are not going to be able to meet your sustainability goal because there is a demand. We've seen what happened recently when uh, we came out of COVID, prices went up, coal start increasing in terms of demand, coal at the highest level today, 8.3 billion ton. So we added a lot in coal just because it's more affordable and the other alternatives are not ready. Today, if you look at solar and wind, it's 5% of the uh, total energy mix. Oil, gas, and, and coal all put together, approximately more than 80% of the energy mix. So to have that shift, you need a realistic time frame for the transition to take place rather than asking for an uh, unrealistic time frame to have this transition at the time of economic headwinds and a lot of countries cannot afford. Uh, and you mentioned also uh, affordability, you mentioned affordability and there is an issue between global north and global south in terms of affordability. Yeah, I'd like to circle back with you specifically on global south, but uh, if I can bring in Patrick into the conversation, then we'll look at Jennifer's uh, technology in, in assisting in the transition. Uh, how do we get to system A to system B? So if we have a hydrocarbon-based system A today and trying to get to system B over the next seven years, which seems unrealistic, but say you roll it forward to 2040, uh, there was a position by the International Energy Agency that said that peak oil, gas, and coal demand will happen in 2030. No. Uh, and we still need you know, $5 trillion a year into renewables. So there seems to be a mismatch even in the language that's being used around the energy transition, Patrick? Yeah, that's right, that's a problem. The key issue is the pace at which we can make the transition. Of course, the scientists clearly told us it's urgent. And they are right, but the science. We are not vet to contest the science. The question is, at which pace can we move the transition? I always remind that when I joined this industry 25 years ago, the mix of the world was uh, 82% of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Last year, it was 81%. <laughs> you will tell me nothing has moved. No, it's not true. But in the meantime, the energy demand has grown by more than 30% because we have 2 billion people additional in the planet, moving from 5 to 7. And because, in particular in China, we've seen an increasing level of way of life, you know, and more energy demand. And so, in fact, what happened is that, yes, we have invested in the last 15 years in solar, wind, uh, over energies, low carbon energies, but it was not enough to compensate the huge increase of demand. And in fact, that's why this transition is complex. It's complex because we are in a system A, what I described, dominated by fossil fuel. We need to be one day in a low carbon system System B, which represents, by the way, the equivalent uh, with this population of 300 million barrels of equivalent. 100 of oil, 70 of coal, 70 of gas, plus 60, so 300. And you know, we want to move that in a new system where we have only, in fact, today more or less 20, 15 percent of it to replace our oil. It's a huge task. Mm -hmm. And what we cannot do, unfortunately, and this is why we have today a big debate is we cannot unplug the system A today, as some people would like, to unplug the fossil fuels because we make CO2 emissions, while we didn't have built the system B, because the planet will not accept. You know, look to the panic last week, not in emerging countries, in Europe. 
when we are facing the possibility to have a lack of security of supply, mm. immediately what did the European governments have done? Mm. Mobilizing all the gas of the planet, all the LNG went for Europe, by the way, pushing Asia countries to go back to coal, because it was we, the Europeans, who have taken the 50 million tons of LNG. We obliged the Asian countries to go back to coal. They had no, no, no more energy. By paying more, we paid more. And so, and when it comes to us, we subsidize our population. More than 500 billion euros have been spent. So that's the real life, sorry to tell you. That's where we are. The real life is that the oil product demand has increased this year. The real life is that in two, it's not me, the ISMIA announced that in 2028 will be at 106 million barrels of oil per day. So the famous scenario would say 70 in 2030, forget, no chance. Zero chance. By the way, to be uh, sympathetic with Fatih Birol, you so journalists are not fair with him. If you read to his interviews, he said it will be 70 if all the countries are meeting the targets. You forget the if. <laughs> you forget everything with the if. Because we all know, people, we are serious people, but the if will not be completed. But there is no way. So that's for me something which is, so how do we do? The priority for me today is clearly to build, to invest more and more in the system B. We need to accelerate the building of it because we can shift only when we have enough energy, low carbon energy. At the same time, because the result of the crisis is clearly that affordability is essential, we need to continue to invest in this system A, in oil, because there is demand, because if we do not invest, then the price go up. And I will tell you what is at stake today because of the price going up in, our, in, in a country like France. is the transition itself, because people they co are confused with all that. They don't understand this. This is a complex matter. And when they see the price going up, they think the CO2 taxation, they think it's a transition. It's a mess. And so then we have a reaction against the transition because it's a matter of purchasing power, even in developed countries. Mm -hmm. So that's fundamental. And there is one energy which can make the transition, of course, is natural gas in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is that, you know, we speak about coal. By the way, I hope everybody in this room knows where the coal is used today. Mm -hmm. It's not emerging countries when I heard. You have 8 billion tons of CO2 emitted by coal today, 8 billion out of 50, which is big. Four is China, two is emerging country, but two are developed countries. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to use coal. Why? Because it's more affordable, mm -hmm. because it's a mix of the chain. So I think there is gas can make this transition. That's why we also need to continue to get gas, because if you have a gas fiber plant, you emit twice less than a coal fiber plant. Is that this solution? But I think today what is really wrong in the narrative is to make antagonization, to antagonize the energies, to say that we should push back by 2030 with fossil fuels. I read yesterday a call from CEOs from other companies. Frankly, I'm not sure they are serious. Because by 2030, maybe I will decide to stop selling them fossil fuels. <laughs> and we'll see who will be, uh, what is the real life. Yeah, let's, so I let's think try, we uh, need let's... to go it. There are maybe some I'm ready to engage with them. No, I was going to say, there was 130 companies, just for the sake of the audience, that yeah. uh, global CEOs that wrote a letter saying that we need to phase down out of fossil fuels because yeah. of the rapid pace of uh, global warming. But again, that's a question of are they ready themselves? In but also the pressure for their consumers, because Patrick, to, you would say Yeah, but that. it's important because to make the transition, it's not a matter only of supply, it's a matter of demand. What is complex is to change the demand pattern. Mm. It, it, you know, to change the transportation of goods. It's not easy. EVs will come, it's there, but they are come massively by 2035, 2040. So we forget that it's not just because you change the supply, but if our customers do not change their demand patterns, it will not work. No. We need to match the demand and the, and the supply. Great. So let's, it's a complex story. Great. We, no, 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 it's a very complicated story, but right now <coughs> it's not moving as fast as people had anticipated, right? Because that was the narrative that we yeah. could flip a switch and it happens. We just have 20 minutes left, so I'm gonna ask everybody to be super direct. Uh, and Jennifer, uh, Lanza Technology is about providing solutions, but I think it'd be good to get your macro view 
of how governments can provide the incentives for the investment that both Amin and Patrick were talking about here. Uh, there's the IRA uh, program legislation in the United States. Uh, there was a duplicate not completely implemented in the European Union, the Net Zero Security Act, or had a different moniker. But how do we get the right incentives to accelerate this huge gap of, from $1 trillion of investment to $5 trillion of investment? Can you share your thoughts? Well, I, I think there's a couple of critical points, right? One is we need to help technology scale up. The very first commercial plant that you build, the second, the third, until you get to the nth, are extremely expensive. And it's chicken and egg, right? If you don't build enough plants, you don't reduce the cost. This happened in solar, this happened in wind, this happened in petroleum, right? The more you build, the cheaper things get, and everything is better. That's why the IRA is so important. The IRA is about how do we make getting hydrogen built out and the costs down? How do we build more infrastructure? How do we help deploy? At the end of the day, it's not about R&D as much as it is about deploying. It's about putting steel in the ground. And the more you put in, the better. So to me, what governments can do is accelerate financing for large-scale production to get it down the cost curve. Okay, very good. And th this sort of carrot approach is one that could work then. A lot of people criticized the IRA when it rolled out, but is it proving to be useful and should it be duplicated? Sure, absolutely, because I see a lot more people who were waiting to build, starting to build. You talk about demand vectors, right? If you get the cost down of hydrogen because of the IRA, people will buy it and use it and that will get more plants built. So this is quite important. I think the only thing I would add is that we always have to remember that all of these incentives have to be technology neutral. They cannot predicate a specific pathway or approach because if they do, what ends up happening is you're incentivizing what we know how to do today and not the new technologies that will do the same thing in a different way three years from now. So I would say governments need to incentivize scale up, help us deploy, but also make sure that everything is based on outcome not the how you get to that outcome. Good. I think we should actually have that conversation, but I'll come back to you on, we have about 25% of the solutions today, right? So yeah. we need 75% to come from innovations, to your point that you were just making. Uh, Henrik, do you have a challenge now in the wind business that the offtake contracts don't support a long-term sustainable market for wind turbines in the future? Um, I think when we, when we look at the current market base, I think when we look at the US, if we look at IRA, uh, which is a good one, I think IRA has been launched as, hey, there's a something that is completely new. IRA built on PTC, structure that was introduced in 1992. It means that you have been building a gigawatt after gigawatt. Every time you move one gigawatt of wind turbines, you support approximately 800,000 households with electricity that is green. And we are doing that across the panel here, and I look to one of uh, good partners and customers over there. But that also means, and I think I'll quote you, Patrick, from one of our leadership conferences where you said, we made one probably mistake in the industry I represent, that we probably draw the LCOE curves, and if we do that long enough, energy and electricity green will be for free. And it's not going to be for free. So when we look at it on today's consumer and also the offtake in the US, and I think this is where Europe has put themselves in comparison to the US because electricity in Europe right now is five times more expensive than it is in the US mm. because we are 30 years behind in actually doing permanent structures of electricity. Mm. And, and that has to come. And unfortunately, uh, I can look to Patrick and we can look to uh, me as the industry but starting blaming someone, and we have just done literally scratching the surface of the energy transition, is wrong. We just have to start doing some of the things and the tools we have. So when we look at it, in most part of the world today, we can build that actually supports the build-out, and also, uh, from an LCOE point of view, will beat uh, coal and building new coal uh, power-fired plants. That's a little bit madness if we do that compared to the renewable uh, opportunities we have. Yeah, it goes back to the pendulum swing that I was yeah. talking about. But, but I'm, I'm just saying here, it's where you then in countries retiring nuclear, 
without putting any other thing in place, then you have a pendulum over here where you don't respect the balance between supply and demand, which is back to your point, uh, Patrick. Good. I'd like to have uh, Mr. Nasser, a very honest conversation, also what uh, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman was suggesting. Uh, why don't you tell this audience the role for Aramco in the energy transition? Because there's a narrative behind the scenes that Aramco is trying to just protect its interests as an oil and gas producer and is not investing in the transition. I think you've heard the same criticism about Total. But how do you see the role of Aramco in the transition? What is your mandate? And with the capital uh, accumulation, do you invest in other technologies to accelerate the transition? We are committed to uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, we are the lowest uh, as an industry when you look at energy intensity, when you look at methane and CO2. And actually, if you bring the rest of the industry to our level in methane, and CO2, you would be reducing globally 1.2 gigatons. So we are doing a lot to achieve that. We are in renewable and hydrogen and uh, e-fuel, carbon capture and storage. We have committed through our sustainability report to reduce 52 million ton by 2035 and reduce our carbon intensity, which is one of the lowest in the world right now, by further 15%. But I think when we look at energy transition, we don't look at it from the narrative of the West. Uh, today, energy transition is all about, does not really solve the priorities and the needs of the global South. Mm. Let me yeah, be clear about that. 80% of what we produce today of energy go to the global South, not to the global North. Mm. 80%. By 2050, 90% of the energy that we produce will go to the global south. There is the 2 billion additional consumers that will be coming. 98% of them will be in the global south, not in the global north. So if we do not look at the global south needs and priorities, today, average per capita in developed world is $55,000. In the global south, it's around $7,000. And when we look at all of these with 2.3 billion people today using polluted cooking fuels, when there is, as His Royal Highness highlighted, 700 to 800 million with not a reliable grid, interrupted power grid, when there is 1 billion today with an income of $1 per day, extreme poverty, and we want a one-size-fits-all for the whole world, well, we have, as a, as a business, we need to solve for all the three. Where is the energy is going to go? It's going to go to the global south. 80% is going to grow to 90%. So we're not going to solve it. We need to solve it for the whole world. And we need to understand something very important. When you talk about emission, if we don't solve the affordability, security, and to reach our sustainability, there is no barrier when we talk about emission. So you can reduce it in one part of the world, you consume 20% or 10% of the global energy, the 80 or 90% consumers, if it's not affordable for them, they will go to whatever is affordable. So I think one size fits all is not acceptable. You need to have a transition that take the economic maturity of different countries and a multi-speed transition. Otherwise, we're not gonna meet our uh, what we are aspiring for by 2050. Another disconnect, if I can bring it up to Patrick, because he's, uh, he's a European-based company, but a global player. During the Russia-Ukraine shock, prior to that, European Union said it did not want to underwrite any more hydrocarbons in Africa. And I know you're invested in Africa, in Mozambique, for example, Senegal, uh, Mauritania has good resources, Tanzania has good, re there are good resources around that could be tapped. Russia, Ukraine happens, they said, we'll underwrite the hydrocarbons, but you have to export 100% of it to Europe. And then there was pressure, in fact, to retract that. How can we get back away from this idea of like colonialism when it comes to energy? And should Africa, you touched upon it just briefly in your last remark, have access to the gas to develop, as I mean suggesting, the global south, if you will. But a good chunk of that is Africa. Of course it has to be, uh, by the way, uh, you know, uh, I completely disagree with the policy uh, 
which are followed today by some G7 countries, to be clear. I think it's really unfair for some of these developing countries to tell them, we'll not finance your resources. And at the same time, by the way, again, shifting 50 million tons of LNG from the rest of the world back to Europe. I think it's not consistent. I think uh, sustainable development goals, you know, the Paris Agreement is a Paris on climate and development. It's not just on climate. We should reconcile that. And so these countries, you know, we'll have 1.5 billion people in Africa, which have a legitimate will to have access to energy. Today, some of them do not have access to energy, to clean cooking, which are having some health issues. So, of course, gas can be part of it. Uh, LPG is a very good condition. You know, today, people are making cooking with uh, wood, plenty of CO2 and smokes, by the way. It's really uh, health issues in Africa. Uh, and uh, we could use LPGs that we have there when we develop gas to deliver to them LPGs, like it has been done in India by uh, Prime Minister Modi in a very efficient way. And it's, it exists, it's there as a solution. Of course, it has a little cost. So finding the way to distribute that is a, is a very pragmatic issue. So we must think, and that's true, that when we are thinking to Africa, when I'm developing an LNG project in Mozambique, we think to export. Part of our duty today is also to keep part of it locally. And you know why Total, Total became Total Energies, by the way? You need to, to listen, to learn, John, a little. Because <laughs> we are in transition. And the transition is all gas and electricity. And electricity, you can produce it with renewables, but also with gas. Mm -hmm. And in Mozambique, we are looking today to make a gas fire power plant in order to deliver electricity to the people. That's an example. This is what we are doing in Iraq now. And by the way, I'm very comfortable in this transition because Again, to come back to the comments of Henrik, electricity and the transition, even electricity, is complex. Mm -hmm. The idea that renewables as a low cost, you don't make running an electricity system only with renewables. It's not true. You need storage, because electricity, you cannot store it. So batteries, you need gas-fired power plants to manage the intermittency. It's a complex system. And by the way, it's why in the company, we don't speak about the renewable business. We, we speak about integrated power business. Mm. We publish our results of integrated power. And by the way, we are demonstrating we can make money and profits, mm. even 10% profitability. So it's feasible, but not only on renewables. Renewable is one way to produce. To cope with intermittency makes the system more complex, more costly, in fact. That's why the prices are going up today. And that is really a business where companies like us can, have, can make a, a large footprint and develop for the future. So Total is becoming Total Energy because we are an energy company. Mm. Oil and gas of today, electricity of tomorrow. And I need now to convince Amin to join me. <laughs> join you in on that between, journey. In between, by the way, there is something. What a rebranding of Aramco. Yeah. That's fairly yeah. bold to put on the stage. In between, by the way, we have one thing that we need to do as an oil and gas company. This is oil and gas pillar. is to slash down the emissions. I think there is a, because we know that we'll need to use this fossil fuel, we need ourselves on our mission mm -hmm. to slash down. We can technologically. On methane, we can go to near zero by 2030, stop flaring, stop venting, and supervising fugitive emissions with drones. All the technologies are there. We can implement that. And I think it's very important that all of us, and I mean, and I, I know we agree, we engage in order to be able to produce with oil and gas differently. And again, we could eliminate three, four million tons, billion tons of CO2 if we produce that differently. I think it's a first duty as long as the system B is not fully enforced. Okay, good. We have uh, about six and a half minutes left, and I want to spend the time, I think, correctly. It wasn't in our agenda. Uh, and you can even put it into this answer, Jennifer. And, uh, Henrik, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. What do you want to see come out of COP28? Because the oil and gas players do have a voice here. This discussion of a decarbonization fund of a scale we haven't seen before. Patrick saying we can take care of methane by 2030. Let's start with you, Jennifer. I'll go to Henrik and we'll get uh, Patrick and uh, Neen to finish. We shouldn't walk away with something kind of airy fairy. We're even having problems getting a loss and damage fund and who's going to be the bank. Be have to get out of COP28 or whatever number it is because they all run together <laughs> at this point. So we want this to stand out. Yeah, region, I think. Um, but I think, you know, how we finance the transition and 
you know, it was mentioned this morning, implementing renewable power in a developing economy is very, very difficult, right? Because high capex, low opex, high cost of capital. That's obvious. But we need to change how we finance what we do. But, but I would also say, from my perspective, I think we really need to start to ask ourselves what resources are going to be the carbon sources of the future. And that's something I care a lot about. And I like to see oil companies collaborate with new people developing new technologies, such as ourselves, to say that maybe there are some things that can be done with carbon that's already above ground. Whether it's CO2, reusing CO2, whether it's trash, right? You know, take apparel and convert it back to apparel. Why are we throwing all these things away? And how do you put them back into the circular carbon economy? You're doing waste to fuel now, right? I'm doing waste to fuels. I'm also waste to materials. This is the polyester in this fleece that Craig Hopper sells was made from steel mill gas. It was going to be an emission, and instead it's polyester. But to be able to achieve any of these things, you have to do something important, and that is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's a right? very good point. Yeah, I mean, we, we imagine these great things that are going to happen in 2050, but we don't take the steps to get there. Do we need every carbon atom in this fleece to come from a renewable resource today? No, we don't. But we can get ourselves on a path to that. And, and there's a lot of things that can be done. And the reason I bring that up in COP is because COP has a lot of governments there. What are the commitments being made by everybody there in terms of what are the next steps, not what the end game is? We all know what the end game has to be. What we need to figure out is how we get from here to there one step at a time. Yeah, one would argue 2050 targets allow you to kick the can down the road, which is not very beneficial at the same time. Yeah. Henrik, very quickly for a minute, then I'm going to go finish with Amin. Yeah, I, I think here I will quote, uh, there is a poem uh, which is called uh, The Emperor Has No Clothes On. <laughs> and I think if we could ask COP28 to get to an understanding, because we've got governments, we've got private sector there, private sector is getting stronger and stronger exchanging with each other. But what I'm, what I'm nervous about is every time we have had a COP, we do the calculation for limiting any temperature increase to one and a half, and we redo a theoretical calculation. The problem with all of this is that's a cumulative, and the steepness of that curve just get steeper and steeper. And I think most of us are getting uncomfortable with the steepness. So I would really love to see that COP28 recalibrate where are we today, Maybe forget 2030, just as we talked about, because the energy transition will take a lot longer. We have the tools, but let also private sector work with it, because too often the political world is struck with 12 or 24 months re-elections, where they then argue yeah. 2030. And I just drew here, I see many, many, many governments having a 2030 goal, and they expect to do 10 times of what they have been doing in the first four or five years in this decade, in 2030. <laughs> and that's actually playing with numbers. Well, in fact, the tripling of renewable capacity, which is an aspirational goal, but by 2030, it's impossible, is it not? Yeah, I, I, I won't sit here. I represent only a, a, a fraction of the energy supply in the world. I'm not aspiring to claim in this humbled uh, company to say that one day I will sit here and represent 90% because it, it won't happen in my lifetime, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, so therefore, we have to let this world work for decade after decade in the energy transition. Good. Uh, I mean, Nasri, we have a, a minute 15. I wanted to see if uh, we can get an upside surprise from the oil and gas industry here or Total Energies and the rest. Can we see a coalition that proves uh, you're part of the solution. What, what would it take to move the needle? We heard what Mike Worth of Chevron said, we're not selling an evil product, uh, but how do, you, how do you move the needle here to, to know that you're action-oriented as a sector, would you say? I, I think what we need is an orderly, inclusive, and just transition where, as I said, you take care of the 84% of the world population, not focus only on the 16%. So we need solutions for all. We need to focus on emissions rather than, you don't tell us, don't do carbon capture and storage, 
blue hydrogen is not good. We need green hydrogen when you cannot afford blue hydrogen. And the other things, you need the industry to be part of the solution. We are part of the solution. We can execute. We have the talent. We know we can put the plans and we know how much it would cost. And if you can afford it, be our guest. We will supply it. I, can, I speak about uh, blue hydrogen. We have failed it, the biggest project in the world. But offtake is an issue, even for Europe, because it is expensive. So the industry needs to be part of the dialogue. This did not happen in previous COPs. We are promised in COP28 there will be a better dialogue with the industry that can deliver, that can execute, that can achieve the net zero by 2050. Great. We have to end it there because of time. But uh, Henrik Anderson, Jennifer Holgram, nice to see you in person. We just did a virtual event. I mean, thank you for the invitation more than anything. It's nice to see I mean, Nasser and Patrick Puyene, uh, excellent as usual. Can we give it a nice round of applause, please? That would be great. Thank you very much.